Ladies and gentlemen, I am your Planetary Defense Commander, Star-Lord Newthor 7, the T. And I am your Asteroid Fight Club, big round table sitter, heavy hitter. We're talking about how a meteorite impacts a house in Uruguay. And this is brought to us by Sci-Fi Wire and Phil Plate of the Bad Astronomy and the Bad Astronomer. And this is a part of my early monthly series where my life is like a game show. And so I try to raise rent every single month in a two or three day span. And I got about 48 hours left to raise about $300. So let me get to impressing you with my fantastic knowledge about stuff. About a about 100 tons of meteoric Metoric? Uh oh crap, I'm in trouble. Material hits the earth every day. It's like meteor junk. Now before you panic, because Phil is real big on he doesn't want people to panic. And I agree. Panicking never helps anything. Essential all of it burns up in our atmosphere. High above the planet's surface. It's like meteor smoke. They say that is what fuels noctilescent clouds. And I said noctilucent weird. Please forgive me. But they say a lot of shit, man. Anywho, yeah, lots of dust. And so when you got comets and asteroids and comet asteroids that are breaking up or shedding. Uh, crap, what is the fancy term for regolithing? When the regolith catches on fire because it's a cat dragon dirty magic snowball anywho so there's a bunch of dust and that dust and stuff ends up in metals and rocks and other alien bits end up in our atmosphere and then sometimes on land you see the vast majority of all that is made up of very tiny bits of rock metal or ice sloughed off of comets or asteroids it's usually the size of a grain of sand or smaller the stuff burns up from 80 to 100 kilometers up. Wow, that is so high. It makes lovely shooting stars for us to ooh and ah at. Have you ever seen a shooting star? What is the biggest, baddest one you've ever seen? Let me know in the comments section. Remember a couple years ago, I was at the ranch. I was inside. And I looked outside. It was night. But it was all lit up. And I was like, why is it daytime outside? And I walked out. And I still had time to see a giant uh, falling star that was like green and yellow. And it sparked twice. But it lit up the whole sky. It was a magical thing. And then I made a wish. <coughs> Be careful what you wish for, though, kids. Be careful what you wish for. And don't get monkey pawed. Be sure to word your wish properly. So any mischievous genies or leprechauns or whoever grants wishes doesn't uh, screw you in the ear hole. All right, great. But sometimes the object is a bit bigger. Uh-oh, we're getting to the danger here. And you see, Asteroid Fight Club is a metaphor for anything that could disrupt and cause supply chains to break down in society. Like having civilization break down. If there's one thing, our parents and our forefathers, a responsibility that they gave us together, it's to make sure that this shit doesn't fall apart. Because though it hasn't been perfect, it's been incredibly impressive that we've made it this far. Especially since we harness electricity. And our, our emotional uh, levels haven't um, graduated much. And I think social networking took us back like 10 steps when it went to personal inner human communication. But that's my opinion. All right. How it behaves depends on the composition. Impact speed, generally several dozens kilometers per second. Entry angle. And even the structure of the incoming meteoroid. Some are riddled with cracks and fall apart easily while others are solid and can penetrate deeper. 
All right. So we've got some that hit at the right entry angle and penetrate much deeper with love and, says Celestial Mechanic, processes. But if it's big enough, uh-oh, at least some of it will survive to hit the ground. Hermione, give me the strength not to make bad jokes. Okay, great. In general, unless the original incoming object is more than a few meters across, it will explode due to the literally crushing pressure of its atmospheric dive, crumbling into much smaller pieces. They slow very rapidly, usually in seconds, then free fall their way to the ground. They reach terminal velocity, a constant speed that balances the pull of gravity and the resistance of the air underneath them. And if it were the opposite of terminal velocity, it would be escape velocity, I would guess. Who knows? I'm sure somebody does. Quickly as well. Man, I messed that tempo and timing up, didn't I? And that depends on their size. Did I repeat any sentences? Feels like I did. Note, this is such a common question that I wrote an article about it. Why do asteroids explode high in the atmosphere? Because they're on drugs? The Earth is pretty big. <clears throat> That's what she said. To me, when we were talking about geology. So that daily RDA of 100 tons of cosmic debris is spread out pretty thinly. The odds of a person or structure getting hit are pretty long. But the chance isn't exactly zero. And let me tell you something. One thing that is 100% is that people will get annoyed. Let's say they get hit in the face with a meteorite and they're bleeding on their face. And if you're like, you know what? The chances of that happening were pretty low. Oh, I gotta get my sense of humor back. Hey, gelatinous cube. That would be weird. If you need Dungeons and Dragons players out there. If the sky started raining, falling stars of gelatinous cubes, would we wish on them? The San Carlos meteorite that hit a house in Uruguay. The green cube is one inch in size. Whoa, dude, was the green cube part of the meteorite? That is amazing. I guess not, though. The arrows indicate the, the fusion crust, fusion, the regmaglyphs, and C, one spot where a piece chipped off. Perhaps the one that hit the TV. And D, a bestest from the roof that got stuck when the rock hit it. All right. What is the green cube? Does that have to do with anything? Is that part of the meteorite? Because if the meteorite hit and it looked like a green gelatinous cube, then it's probably an alien. It was like a Trojan horse. And you probably have a virus if you go in anywhere near it. Crap. Everybody's probably like green jello people now. Just one more challenge we got to deal with. On September 18, 2015. What? Man. Holy crap. Like, my survival as planetary defense commander. And Thor News, the YouTuber, and me living in an apartment, depends on doing a badass article that is up to freaking date. And so this is, we're talking about four years? Hmm. Oh. Eh. Sorry. A tiny asteroid entered Earth's atmosphere above San Carlos, Uruguay. Uruguay? It's unknown how big it was, but most likely far less than a meter. It broke up as it descended, as do most relationships, eventually creating lots of smaller pieces that fell to Earth, as do most relationships. One of them, a chunk of rock about nine centimeters in length, defied the odds. Congratulations. It slammed into a house in San Carlos. I'm sorry. Piercing the roof, a piece broke off and hit their TV, damaging the screen because, duh, while the main piece hit their bed before finally coming to rest on the floor, which it was also damaged. Wow, happily no one was home at the time. Even so, the odds of someone getting hit are of course even smaller. What? People have a far smaller cross section than the house. Good thing it was moving at about 90 meters a second, over 300 kilometers per hour. Oof. This is a very rare meteorite indeed. The gelatinous cube or the obestus uh, magnet thing. 
A team of meteorists analyzed the meteorite and published their results in a recent journal. Oh, that's why this article's coming out now. There were a few eyewitnesses to the bolide. Don't lie to me, bolide. Don't lie to me. The bright meteor as it passed through our atmosphere. And they reported as bright as the full moon. And while the sorts of accounts are notoriously inaccurate, that does fit it with being some something relatively small. <clears throat> For comparison, the 19-meter Chelyabinsk asteroid impact in 2013 was as bright as the sun. And it broke a lot of windows. Let me just say this. I know some people out there love it. I'm going to add just, you know, one quick throwaway conspiracy theory to each video. It's not weather or weather. And so, you know, when I see falling stars, they always have that where they kind of blow up and then they do a straight line again and then they blow up again and they're like boom, boom. Uh, they, they always do that. It seems like mostly like 90% of the time. So I'm like, oh, that's a spaceship re-entering the atmosphere. You know, it's a conspiracy theory. I wouldn't, you know, invest money on that. The big chunk, they hit the house, is about nine times, ten times, six centimeters, and has a mass of a little over 700 grams. It is covered in a dark fusion crust. Long dash. Phil loves those damn long dashes. A thin layer of burned material coating the surface, comma, common in meteorites, long dash, and also has regmoglyphs, little scoops out of it that look like someone stuck their thumb in clay. Oh, conspiracy theory. It's fake. Those form as the meteoroid tumbles as it falls. The heat and pressure carve dimples on it. Kind of like your face. The scientists sawed off a part of the meteorite for analysis. And it screamed. And that didn't. It was stony. I told you it was high. With olivine, proxene, and small amounts of iron and nickel. Fairly typical. It's also brisiciated. Whoa, new word. I don't even know what that means. Oh, which means it's like lots of smaller pieces. Oh, gather. Whoa. You know, my first name's T. It's like he doesn't like me so much he left out the T and together. Oh, gather. By other material. Again, that's common, period. It has small spherical mineral inclusions in it. Making it what we call a chondrite. Technically, it's been classified as an LL6 chondritic brestia. Meaning the chondrules aren't well separated from the material between them. Like what happens when you leave your cereal and milk for too long. Huh. The paper, of course, has far more details if you're interested. They also discuss the fall itself and how often structures are hit. Answer, extremely rarely. Meteors. Well, thank you. Oh, we got more of this wonderful article. Interestingly, the authors say this is the first confirmed meteorite impact in Uruguay. They said that another one, called Begoria, is a hoax. See? Fake shit everywhere. A scam from certain unscrupulous people to sell cheaper meteorites for more money. The whole story is complicated, but Argentina has very strict rules about expropriating meteorites. So the scammers either bought up or smuggled out a bunch of Campo de Cilios, inexpensive, not very high quality, Argentinian iron meteorites. What? <laughs> okay, so they went and got other meteorites to sell as a new meteorite, and that shit is illegal. They claim they found them just over the border in Uruguay. That way they could sell them, they hoped, without getting in trouble with the Argentinian government. Oh, so they were laundering meteorites. That's new. All right, so the story's cool. Good job, Phil. I didn't know you could launder meteorites. You, capitalism never fails to surprise me. However, there is real Bay Goria, a huge 80 kilogram, well, technically I'm never surprised. Kilogram iron mass that was found in Uruguay in 1994. Banking on that, the scammers bought a bunch of campos to a mineral show. Brought. And tried to pass them off as Begoria. 
Well, I bet they look dumb whenever the experts there were like, you fakers, get your ass out of here. Experts could tell the difference right away. Scammers claimed they found them in water. There was no hint of oxidation on them. Oh, and if the audio cuts out mysteriously, it wasn't on the recording I did or the recording I uploaded. Uh, apparently, there's a gang of people on the internet that are really fantastic at hacking and they like to kick me in the balls a whole lot. Even though I love them, experts could tell the difference. Oh, we already read that shit. <clears throat> the scammers claim they banned them in water. Yeah, don't listen to what scammers say, man. Words are the way they scam you. But there was no hint of oxidation on them. Did you know oxygen can be damaging? And they looked exactly like Campos. See, when you call it Campos, it makes it sound like a dude. I collect meteorites. Well, and they can be very expensive. Huh. Oh. Have you ever tried to smoke one? I'm not surprised. Some people try to scam buyers, but bringing them to a mineral show where lots of professional licensed dealers roam the halls is a new level of dumb. Always buy from licensed dealers. Um, or meteorite dispensaries. Do they have those? Incidentally, my good friend Yolf Notkin is a dealer. Wow. And has a wonderful page about what to do if you think you found a meteorite. Is it legal to have sex with a meteorite? I'm just asking. You'll find interesting info there, even if you haven't found something. I don't know, because there be, could be like alien, you know, amoeba in there. And so it would consider life. Okay, my jokes have got to get better. I contacted GF to clear up some of this whole Bagoria thing. And also because I couldn't remember what meteorite hunters call ones that hit structures. I knew there was a nickname, but I couldn't recall it. And I knew he'd know. He did. They're called Hammerstones. So cool. Man, yeah, I love Phil. Other people may hate him. A man in like a buddy cop film. We're a pretty decent duo. Hammerstone, so cool. Just like me, just like you, just like y'all. Bottom line for this story, meteorite impacts on structures are incredibly rare. So this was a genuinely interesting fall with a lot of scientific wonderfulness in it. And a story about capitalism and why people try to rip people off in the most bizarre of ways. A lot of times, it catches up with them. I'm glad no one was hurt. I'm glad we got to hear another interesting story from an event like this 